topic I'd worked on too since the 1970s. I was interested in it. I thought they, he and an associate did uh, very good work on uh, collecting the documentary record on analysis and commentary. Uh, I have read his work, some of his work, not all of it, on uh, colonialism, on uh, history of Native Americans. Uh, a lot of it I thought was, uh, was well done, got me looking at sources and so on. I can't really comment in detail without going back to look at it carefully. Sure. Now, one of the one of the statements I thought was very interesting that you had mentioned was right now he is uh, under investigation by I guess the 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 next step of the the review committee consisting of five people that are to make the final determination on the, the remaining charges brought against him, which I believe are plagiarism, um, academic fraud, um, the other charges, free, um, which in terms of freedom of expression ethnic identity have been dropped. Um, you, made, you made a statement that I found interesting, and uh, it, you had mentioned that um, if these charges were serious, they would have been brought up before, and, um, and really um, thought that these charges might be more of a red herring after the fact. Um, I thought I would, would add some information to that, because the Rocky Mountain News actually did a good-sized piece on all the instances that Native American groups and individuals um, including those in academia, did bring questions about his scholarship beforehand, even the, before he was tenured. Was there an investigation? There was no investigation. That's my point. The investigation came after the collapse of the charges against him. For that reason alone, it's pretty hard to take him seriously. Mm -hmm. now, people can make charges anytime they feel like. But it is possible, too, that even though it does bring um, suspicion, that it, it still is. And it doesn't bring suspicion. Anyone who's in the public I can, it can be denounced from all over the place. Look, when I go home tonight, I'm going to get the usual dose of 100 emails or so, and I can predict that there'll be a selection among them from at least four of the internet industries. There are huge internet defamation industries that are operating. Uh, one of the four will be, or maybe several, uh, proving that I'm uh, supporting Osama bin Laden. Uh, second will be proving that I want all Jews to be sent to crematoria. Third will be proving that I'm a CIA agent trying to undermine the left. A fourth will be that I'm a Mossad agent trying to destroy Palestinian rights. And then there'll be a couple of others like, uh, you know, I want uh, to kill ch babies or whatever it may be. But at least these four industries will be going because they're going strong and they have a lot behind them. Uh, and does that make any difference? I mean, anyone who's in the public eye, if you can't respond to what they say, you defame. I mean, if it's a really violent state, like our colonies, you don't defame, you blow their brains out. Like that picture over there, uh, which is what happens to intellectuals in U.S. colonies. In this case, it happens to be El Salvador, six leading Jesuit intellectuals, 
had their brains blown out. Over on the right is the archbishop who was assassinated. That's what we do to people in places where you can use force. At home, you can't do that. So you have defamation. So the fact that the Churchill was defamed simply shows he's saying something interesting. So it almost becomes like a badge of honor. It's not a bad badge of honor. It comes with turf. That was actually um, what, I, what I was referring to was um, you know, sometimes being out there, being in the public area, charges do get brought after the fact, too. But doesn't that also come with the territory? So no. No. If charges come at a, if charges are legitimate, they'll come not timed after a case has fallen apart. I mean, that doesn't prove the charges are illegitimate, but to any rational person, it raises very high suspicions that the charges are just uh, after the failure to carry out a totally illegitimate inquiry. And my question would be that the, the original CD review committee, I believe, consisted of a dozen people, a dozen people over his peers, decided that the charges did have merit to go to uh, the charges of plagiarism. And when were they brought? Um, those charges they were, were brought on the occasion of a different charge, namely a charge about a talk he gave on 9-11. That's when the other charges came along. That alone tells any rational person that it's pretty hard to take this seriously. If the charges were legitimate, why did they wait for that occasion? And then would the, would the question then fall on these people on the committee as in their, their actions to arouse suspicion? In my opinion, their being on the committee arouses suspicion. What right does a university or a state or anyone have to question what uh, some uh, academic figure says? Could there, in the area of academic freedom, uh, on the other side, uh, academic responsibility? I do understand the part that you're saying is that these charges could, are brought after the fact that they were never, um, that CU did not decide to pursue them regardless if they were ever brought to their attention. Um, is there an area that in these charges of academic responsibility in terms of, it seems they're questioning whether he did follow proper scholarship? Have you seen anything like that? Well, that would be possible. You could take the entire Harvard faculty and investigate them as to how, whether they follow proper scholarly procedures, and I am certain you will find a huge number of cases where they don't. Uh, if you want me to give you examples, I can, where people publish, respected people, you know, distinguished professors, publish what they know to be outright lies, uh, fabrication, for the purpose of defamation, for the purpose of state worship, and so on. There's case after case about this. I mean, I've actually published some of them, most of them I don't bother with because I don't like to explore these gutters. Uh, but if anyone wants to carry out such inquiry, it'll be easy. You know, take the, uh, I'll tell you right where to start. It's, it seems like from Churchill's case, because um, Churchill has been no newcomer to statements that could be considered uh, controversial, but now, is it really the subject of 9-11, or is it more to it than that that you see from external forces? Look, I don't frankly know what he said about 9-11, and I don't care. But there's plenty of, but statements that are controversial are all over the place. I mean, open any newspaper, any scholarly article, take any topic you want. Uh, take, for, take, say, perhaps the most covered topic in the last uh, 40 years, the war in Vietnam. The statements that are made about that 100% of the time, close to that, are not only controversial, but outrageous. For example, try, I was just reading Foreign Affairs last night. Alvin Laird was giving his version of the war in Vietnam. Nobody would see anything wrong with it. Uh, he takes the conventional framework. The US intervened to defend South Vietnam from North Vietnamese aggression. And then, did we do it right? Did we do it wrong, and so on? Every one of those statements is an outright lie. Uh, the United States invaded to attack South Vietnam. Uh, before the North Vietnamese were ever even significantly involved, the United States had practically wiped out South Vietnam. Furthermore, that can be demonstrated from their own sources. But can anybody say that? No. What you have to say is lies and deception of a kind that we would regard as utterly outrageous if they appeared in the old Soviet Union. Uh, we can start from there. You want to go on? Yeah, there are, con there are statements that are not only controversial, but outlandish on just any topic you want. Do we investigate them? Do we investigate the whole faculty for that? No.
That's not the way to deal with it. The way to deal with it is to expose it, not to investigate it. Would you say that also there could be different standards for a public official as opposed to somebody in um, every, every, every academic, academic works is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just how uh, you want to run through the academic literature. It all takes the same premises. I just happen to be reading this. All right. Well, I would like to go more into the um, the issues of academic freedom and freedom of speech. I mean, I, I've read, read a lot that um, that you have written on it, um, uh, especially in the area of protecting the rights of people who were probably outside of most people's comfort zone, including probably especially in academia itself. Um, I'm just skipping over the questions you've already answered. Um, I, I would like to ask something of you first in terms of the Jewish reference. Um, you, I know you mentioned that you, you didn't really um, choose to follow the speech, but it has been brought up time and time again in short um, The 9-11 essay that he wrote. But one thing that has actually caused quite a bit of controversy was the comparison of the people involved in financial business in the World Trade Center of the equivalent of a Nazi officer, Adolf Eichmann. Um, the term technocrats was thrown out, and the term little Eichmanns was thrown out. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you may be with, with Adolf Eichmann in the sense. Okay, you are. I would, I would like to ask you about the comparison that he makes in saying that these people were little Eichmanns because even though they weren't the ones doing the killing, they knew about that their actions would cause mass killings of the third world from imperialism, but they chose not to act upon that. And my question is based on this information. Do you think that's an accurate reference? Well, fairly plausible and I think standard picture of Eichmann is Hannah Arendt. Uh, nobody thought she was a Nazi, at least I didn't. Her picture of Eichmann was that he was a technocrat, didn't really pay much attention to what he was doing. That's what she, her phrase, the banality of evil comes from that. So if that's what Eichmann was doing, a technocrat moving things around without paying attention, then a little Eichmann would be a minor variant of that who's also pushing papers around and not paying attention to what he's doing. It's not a comparison I would make, but uh, certainly not an outrageous comparison. Some Jewish groups have, have mentioned that they, they do consider an outrageous comparison, sure. and that is, that is their issue, too. And I, I've read um, the thing about the banality of evil. Um, could, though, another argument be made, a plausible argument? I mean, it's not just banality, because there has to come an awareness of not caring, but I think what you've also written a lot of is that how many people choose to make themselves unaware of the events that do happen around the world from U.S. policy. So does that still qualify as banality, or is that more in terms of ignorance or not? That's who it is. The ordinary person on the street is probably ignorant. I mean, if you're flooded with massive reporting, education, uh, uh, scholarly literature, if you read it, which says, for example, that the U.S. was defending South Vietnam, how are you supposed to, well, what, what's going to keep you from believing it? Uh, you know, unless you really search. So that's ignorance. If we're talking about the people who have better access to information, uh, it shades off into deceit. I mean, take anyone acquainted enough with Vietnam to have actually looked at the Pentagon Papers, say, or to have read Bernard Fall, who by everybody's, let's say the Pentagon's position is that he's the one civilian specialist who has to be taken seriously. He's the only person, he's the only non-government person even mentioned in McNamara's memoirs. And he's understood, he was a hawk, and he was understood to be the leading military historian and Vietnam specialist and hawkish. Well, in 1967, he wrote that Vietnam, as a, this is almost a quote, as a cultural and historical entity is likely to become extinct under the attack of the most uh, you know, horrendous uh, military assault that's ever happened in modern times. He was talking about South Vietnam. Is that how you defend South Vietnam? By destroying it to the point where it might become extinct, according to the leading specialist who happens to be a hawk? Well, anybody who's read at least that far, and this is the major scholar, and knows the background, and then says we were defending South Vietnam, well, at this point, we're moving beyond banality. And that's uh, pretty close to 100% of scholarship. 
what it really sounds like you're making the case for is that what one academia says that might ruffle some feathers really pales in comparison to actual policy and awareness. Um, well, not only does it pale, but don't forget in this case, it has consequences for policy. I mean, if in fact we were defending South Vietnam, that gives it, makes it legitimate for us, and it was used that way, to defend Nicaragua uh, by sending a terrorist mercenary force uh, to practically wipe the country out. And it makes it legitimate for us to have armed and trained the elite battalions that carried out that assassination, and on and on. So this goes well beyond uh, a comment. These are, this is an overwhelming mass of doctrine which has direct consequences, human consequences, on a vast scale. So it's incomparably more important than whatever it is that Lord Churchill may have said. It's interesting you brought the subject of Nicaragua, because I did read and actually listen to some of your audio books on a subject of something that could not be more obvious in terms of the U.S. not following uh, or what in the World Criminal Court or UN Court. Um, or, or, yeah, World Court, Court of Justice. Justice. And the U.S. Yeah. now has the honor of being the only country to have rejected uh, a World Court decision. Uh, before, up till recently, it had some company, uh, Enver Hoxha's Albania. Uh, but with the overcoming of that ultra-Stalinist dictatorship, the U.S. now stands alone. This is something that ought to be taught in elementary school, just as what's there ought to be taught. If it's concealed, that's serious deception. Not only scholarly fraud and journalistic fraud, but with enormous policy consequences. Now, Lord Churchill has repeatedly said, and I'm not speaking engagements, in terms of what he suggests the U.S. is to do. And the US, he just basically says, follow the law. Follow international law, and then makes the, infers that then the Middle East terrorists will leave you alone, they won't be bombed. Do you, based on that, do you think that would be realistic, that if the U.S. did decide now to follow international law in terms of the World Criminal Court, World Court, things would change in terms of? Right. We can, here there happens to be good scholarship, and it generally conforms to his view. Uh, in fact, even government documents do. So if you go back to the, uh, I, mean, I don't think it would be perfect. I mean, they probably never heard of Nicaragua in the Middle East. Uh, but there is, uh, it, let's take a look at the record that we have. In 1958, uh, and any scholar interested in the Middle East or journalist interested in the Middle East should know this. In 1958, President Eisenhower uh, asked his staff uh, why there is what he called a campaign of hatred against us among the people of the Middle East, not the government, but the people. Well, the National Security Council, highest planning body, had given an analysis of this, and it said the reason for the campaign of hatred against us is that the people of the Middle East uh, consider that we uh, act to oppose democracy and development and support brutal and despotic regimes, and that we do so because we want to main take, maintain control over their energy resources. And then it went on to say, yeah, that's sort of correct, so it's understandable why they think that. Well, that was 1958. Okay, after 9-11, and so it continues. Let's go to after 9-11. After 9-11, the Wall Street Journal, to its credit, uh, was, I think, the only newspaper to have tried to do a survey of opinion in the Middle East. I mean, they kept to the kind of people they were interested in, what they called moneyed Muslims, like uh, you know, bank managers, uh, heads of transnational corporations, lawyers, and so on. The people right in the middle of the U.S.-run globalization project, so no questions about that, and wealthy and so on. Found the same thing. This is a campaign of hatred against us based on exactly the same reasons. Now, with new ones. Uh, the new ones were support for Israeli atrocities and the sanctions against Iraq. Now, they hated Saddam Hussein, but they knew what we're not supposed to know, uh, that the sanctions were killing hundreds of thousands of people, that they were destroying the society, they were strengthening the tyrant, and probably keeping him in power because the population was dependent on him for survival. And that causes a campaign of hatred. Well, now, if we were to change policy, would that go? Probably. In fact, the Pentagon agreed. So, for example, Paul Wolfowitz uh, explained one of the reasons for invading Iraq was to be able to move 
military bases out of Saudi Arabia. And he said, yeah, it's true, our bases in Saudi Arabia are what inflame um, groups like Al-Qaeda. They regard that as an invasion of the most holy land, so fine, we'll move them somewhere else. So he agrees. What so what's, what's the debate? debate? What Ward Churchill also did mention in regards to Iraq was it was the, the sanctions taking place um, during the 90s, which uh, Mayor Law right, whether even though she's backtracked on that in terms of her statements, the fear that Ward Churchill uses is half a million plus um, Iraqi children. That's uh, what she and, agreed to. Yeah, so and she, she said the price is worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, since then, even though she did make some statements saying that in, on democracy now, um, that she did not make the decision she was talking about, but regardless of whether, what the facts were. That's, that's why I didn't mention it. Everyone agrees that the toll was in the hundreds of thousands and that it devastated the civilian society and it enriched and empowered the tyrant and it compelled people to rely on him for survival. That we know. So it actually had the opposite effect of what was intended. Who said? Maybe what was in, you usually, if you're in a court of law, you determine intent by predictable consequences. This was a completely predictable consequence. It was observed year after year, and it gives a plausible suggestion about intent, not that, namely, that uh, the U.S. didn't want the population to overthrow them. And in fact, we have further evidence for that, in fact, almost definitive evidence. Uh, after the first Gulf War, 1991, uh, there was a major Shiite rebellion in the South, which probably would have overthrown Saddam, but the U.S. prevented it. Uh, the U.S. authorized Saddam to use military aircraft to crush it. He refused requests, the U.S. refused, Bush number one, refused requests from rebelling Iraqi generals just for access to captured Iraqi equipment and laid the basis for Saddam's vicious crushing of a rebellion which might have overthrown him. Now that was explained, explained, like in the New York Times. So the Middle East correspondent of the New York Times, Alan Cowell, said, well, you know, ugly and unpleasant, but he said there is a consensus among U.S. and British leaders and their allies that uh, Saddam Hussein is preferable for the stability of the region than those who are trying to overthrow him. Stability is a code word for our control. Uh, Thomas Friedman, then chief diplomatic correspondent, uh, wrote that for the U.S., the best of all worlds would be an iron-fisted military junta in Iraq, running it just the way Saddam did. But since we can't get someone else, we'll have to settle for him. It wasn't secret. Well, does that indicate that the intention was to prevent uh, the Iraqi people from overthrowing them on their own? Yeah, I think so. The pl I mean, you can't prove it. We need some internal they documents. It certainly can be inferred from plenty of evidence, including the predictable and predicted effects of the uh, sanctions. So from all, all this, um, that can be inferred, what, what you're also doing in terms of information, can the argument be made, as Ward Churchill is claiming, that the catalyst for um, the attacks on 9-11 could be largely devoted to the sanctions that the U.S. government did not recognize? Well, if you take a look at the scholarship on Al-Qaeda, it's quite a lot of it by now, very good scholarship. Uh, by you know, people like Michael Schreuer, who was the chief U.S. investigator or independent scholars uh, and others. Uh, one thing they all stress is that uh, bin Laden's words and actions conform pretty closely. So he's telling us what he's planning to do, he's giving us the reasons, and they do it. Well, these are among the reasons. I mean, you know, he has plenty of other reasons, too. I mean, his main targets. I assume with them, with scholarship and U.S. intelligence, I see no reason to question them, that their conclusion is correct, that he's probably telling us pretty much what he thinks. But what he's telling us is that his main targets are the, uh, the tyrannies in the Gulf that the U.S. is supporting, like Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabian monarchy is his main target, so that's a scare of him. Uh, he wants to establish his own version of radical Islam, uh, all over the Islamic world and uh, in their terms to defend the Muslim world from outside aggression. And that's pretty much what they've done. So, for example, take the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. I mean, the jihadis went in there with U.S. support. I mean, you know, U.S. 
basically created the jihadi movement in Afghanistan. They went in to drive the Russians out of a Muslim land. While they were fighting in Afghanistan, they were carrying out terrorist attacks inside Russia. We didn't report that much here, it was happening. Serious, almost led to a Russian-Pakistan war. As soon as the Russians pulled out, they stopped attacking Russia from within Afghanistan. They still attack Russia from within Chechnya, but that's another Muslim land under attack. And it continues. Their, uh, uh, their words are pretty closely conform, conform pretty closely to their deeds. So therefore, I think U.S. intelligence and independent scholarship is probably pretty accurate in giving the reasons. Whether that's what Churchill said or not, I don't know. I, don't, I read them. I don't yeah, sure. I, I would like to bring around to the subjects of freedom of speech in academia. I'd actually like to get to also perhaps a Muslim issue in college campuses. But before I do that, I would like to bring up something that's been well known is in your defense. Uh, in fact, this was shown in the movie Manufacturing Consent and then also written about by you quite extensively on, I believe, in France, there was a scholar who you were defending for his Holocaust denial. And you made a point. Uh, of course, expressing a lot about um, probably uh, people very much involved in free speech and committed to not on the basis of content, but on the principle of it. Uh, one thing I did notice about that was near the end uh, of one of the interviews you had given, is you would disassociate, you felt you seemed necessary to disassociate from his beliefs. Something that I believe you said that it was repugnant, and of course you don't believe it's poppycock, something along those lines. Do you feel that? I believe at that time you felt that it was important enough to say, look, I don't associate with agree with I, I had to say that because of the overwhelming Stalinist fascist character of Western intellectual life, which seems incapable of understanding of what Voltaire understood and what was a standard principle in the Enlightenment, that you, if you defend free speech, you defend it precisely for views that you find objectionable. I mean, Stalin and Goebbels were perfectly happy to defend speech that they approved of. If you're a defender of free speech, as a criterion, you defend the speech of the views you find most objectionable. You can read that in a Supreme Court uh, case near versus Minnesota, for example. That's the core of freedom of speech. Now, because Stalinist fascist doctrines are so deeply ingrained in intellectual life, it is actually necessary, unfortunately, to make, the, to make the comments of the kind you mentioned. Incidentally, just to take your first sentence, I did not support Florissant. I never did, and I never will. I supported his right to freedom of expression. I happened to oppose what was, that, what was at stake in that was very straightforward. It was a Stalinist Nazi principle that the state shall have the right to determine historical truth and to punish deviation from it. As an anti-Nazi and an anti-Stalinist, I'm opposed to that. And that's exactly the issue that was at stake there. He was brought to court uh, on the charges of falsification of history. And the state, through the courts, was going to determine whether he falsified history. That comes straight out of Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. Doesn't Canada also have similar law to that too? Or the Pardon? Um, yes. Canada, yes. 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 The United, United States, States is one of the very few countries that has reached a reasonable standard of protection of freedom of speech. I've written this over and over. Canada has terrible standards. Britain has much worse standards. And France has practically no standards at all. The reason why I brought that up is because um, sometimes I think you felt the need, sometimes other people feel the need to disqualify themselves from the content, feel like they have to make a point of doing it because, like you mentioned, the backlash is so overwhelming. It's yes, not the backlash, it's because of the lack of comprehension among educated people of the most elementary principles of the Enlightenment. Given their lack of comprehension, it's necessary to explain these things to them. That's like if you have a three-year-old who doesn't understand why he shouldn't run out into the street, yeah, you gotta explain it to them. So if people literally cannot un comprehend the concepts of freedom of speech that were developed during the Enlightenment, yes, then you have to explain them to them. Do you think that all in American society needs to, people need to have explained yeah, uh, word, about word, I would say in this case, Ward Churchill, and why I bring that up is because it can be argued Ward Churchill himself has a very poor record on the issue of standing up for free speech. Yeah, yeah. Criticizing for it. It's not going to do anything.
Well, they probably might have to do something that many people do have claimed to support him, saying that I do not agree with what he says, or I might have questions what he says, but I definitely support him, not just for his first speech. But supporting him. They're supporting his, I mean, some people may be supporting what he said, fine, they have every right to do that, it's free society. Just like he has a right to express himself, they have a right to express support for it. But there's a very natural move, an improper move, from supporting someone's right to express his views to supporting the person. Those are radically different. Now in a free society, where people, a civilized society, where people understood the concepts of freedom of speech that go back to the Enlightenment, you, would have, you could stop there. But in an uncivilized society, where people don't understand freedom of speech, unfortunately, it's like the three-year-old crossing the street. You have to explain to them that supporting a person's rights to, to free speech does not mean supporting the person's views, or even knowing what they are, which is irrelevant. Do you think, though, that for the American public for a time is going to need um, further reminders of... It's not so much the public as the intellectual community, which are the worst offenders in this case. I can probably give examples that I've seen from my travels into the intellectual community. One very good example recently is DePaul University. It happened to be one of the areas that Lord Churchill stopped by at the same time Lord Churchill stopped by. One of the professors of John by the name of Thomas Klocek was being removed because he got into an argument with several Muslim groups. And um, basically that's exactly what it was. It was not in hearing. He, his position he was suspended without pain. He was told he had to issue a public apology and accept a remedial role. Uh, aren't incidents like this? I can't comment. Sure. I know nothing about the sure. I, I was going to say... I mean, if a professor, for example, um, say, in, in relation to a student, uh, said things that were insulting and offensive. Yeah, that's so uh, on the basis of speech because well, it yeah, depends yeah. what the context was. For example, if it's a classroom, it's one thing. If it's in a halls, it's another thing. If it's a relation of dominance, like he's in a position to do something to them, that's another thing. Uh, all of these factors have to be taken into consideration. And since I don't know the case, I can't talk about. Sure. I was going to say, do you think there is a political drive that can clearly, uh, in terms of suppression of free speech um, in academic area, that can be said it is political. There are people on one side of the political spectrum, and where does that fall? Oh, right now there's an enormous attack on the universities. Now, the reason I'm sure is that the universities are about the last institution in the society that's not virtually a wholly owned subsidiary of the corporate system. So they're under tremendous attack. Uh, naturally under the rubric of academic freedom, just as Orwell would have predicted, uh, because to ensure that they adhere closely enough to a ultra-right-wing party line, it's called academic freedom. Uh, Middle East departments are under particular attack, uh, but the same is true of the universities generally. I think there are about a couple of dozen state legislatures now that are considering, maybe some have passed, uh, legislation to monitor uh, what is done in the universities to ensure that there is, isn't what's called a liberal bias. Well, the fact is the universities are sort of center to right, uh, but what's called a liberal bias means you know, too many people vote for the Democrats, that is for the center right party instead of the far right party. Uh, this attack is very serious, uh, it's vicious, and it's extremely harmful to academic freedom, and it's taking place all over. It's, it's very widespread, and it's got plenty of money behind it. So it's not like somebody sniping from the sidelines. It sounds like what you might be referring to, one of the items is David Horowitz's yes, exactly. academic bill of rights, which I should mention passed in the Colorado State Legislature. Yeah, that's such a disgrace. Could you comment on the academic, the proposed academic bill of rights and where it's It's, it's a bill attacking academic freedom, which as Orwell would have predicted, is called a bill for academic rights. I don't know what version passed there, but the versions I've seen call for surveillance of courses and behavior based on anecdotes from students uh, to determine whether uh, the university is sufficiently supportive of U.S. power, of Israeli actions, and so on. If it's not sufficiently supportive of those, it has to be censured. And the charges that are brought, which I have looked at, are based on random anecdotes. I mean, you know, it's a very easy way. First of all, the whole, the whole investigation is grotesque in the first place. 
But if any, just to tell you, to determine whether these people are, people are even minimally serious, minimally, let's point out a simple elementary way in which they can determine uh, whether the universities are biased, not that it's any of their business. Uh, so take, say, Israel, which is centerpiece of their attack. Take a poll among faculty, here's a trivial way. Take a poll among faculty in the university you like and ask a simple question. Should Israel have the same rights as any state in the international system? Okay, uh, you know what the answer will be, 100% yes. Okay, that ends the charge of bias. And that's a good reason why they don't take the poll because it'll blow up the story instantly. What they really mean is a different question. Do you think Israel should have more rights than any state in the international system? Well, if they asked that question, they'd probably get about 50% say it means needs more rights, which is the official U.S. government position, incidentally, that Israel should have rights beyond those of any in the international system. It should be the only state in the international system where there's a recognition of its abstract right to exist. So it doesn't exist in international law but is insisted on by the United States and Israel because they know that the other states have accepted their right to exist in peace and security, so they had to raise the barriers. All right, do those polls, take it 10 minutes, and you get the answer to the question of bias. And you can do the same poll on U.S. policy. So for example, take a poll in any university you like uh, and ask uh, how many people think the United States invaded South Vietnam in 1962 and had practically destroyed it by 1967. You probably get maybe 1%, which means that 99% are totally committed to the party line. Uh, that ends that story. And we can do it over and over again. But they're not going to do that. Now they're going to say some student said somebody looked at me the wrong way or something. Uh, and on the basis of that, set up outrageous inquiries and even more outrageous legislation to control university teaching and curriculum to ensure that they adhere more closely and rigidly to a party line that they impose. I want to ask so that, that might that pass in North Korea, it shouldn't pass here. I want to ask how that brings around to the subject of what you mentioned in terms of certain behavior on campus, um, such as speech codes too. Um, I actually did remember seeing something on Penn and Teller show where you're briefly interviewing and I don't know if things were taken out of context, a statement was made about the university being a home. Uh, my question would be around that, um, one, uh, aside from what could be acceptable or not acceptable in a natural working environment, do you feel any university, any public university, has a right to impose its own form of speech codes and what could those possibly be? Oh, sure. I mean, it's obvious. It, you, I'm sure you agree that, if I, for example, suppose I'd say I want to go into your house and put up a uh, anti-Semitic poster on your dining room wall. Do you agree that I should have the right to do that? Well, if you're asking me, I would say, my house could do it somewhere else. No, I'm asking, to, no, I'm asking, I, I, my right of free speech demands that I go into your house and on your dining room wall I put up an anti-Semitic poster. Do I have a right to do that? I would say, my you house know what is a public house. To say it fast. I could say, um, no, no, but unless maybe if I found it funny, being a Jew, yeah. I tend to like anti-Semitic stuff. Oh, so you would like me to go into your house and put in it? I'm, I'm not, you're evading the question. Yeah. The question is, do I have a right to do it? Right. Of course you don't have a right. Period. Period. Okay. okay, now let's turn to the college. Take a college dorm. Uh, if you have a, you know, 18-year-old child in a college dorm, that dorm is that person's home. Think no, of um, things like Hamas or um, groups like PLO, and somebody says, I don't like that because I'm a Jew, or maybe if I were the Star of David, somebody says, I don't like that. Yeah. That's, that's why you can't make blanket rules about what can be in a public space. But there are principles that you can adhere to and try to balance them. The principle is that a dorm is not uh, like your own living room. A dorm is somebody's home, and somebody's home different principles apply than apply to your living room. Incidentally, the same is true of public spaces uh, in a Times Square ad. So if somebody wants to put up a, uh, an ad in Times Square uh, praising a crematoria for Jews, they're not going to be allowed to do it, nor should they be. And that's not covered by freedom of speech, because that's a public space. Now, exactly where to draw the lines? Well, you know, that uh, requires some thought. But the principles 
but you know, to try to take an abstract principle and say either you can do everything or you can't do anything, that's absurd. Uh, life is a complicated affair. There are many different factors that enter. There are some principles that govern it, and you have to make choices and decisions, reasoned decisions based on them. And sensible people could differ on some of those, not on the kinds we've talked about, I don't think. Yes, then, do you think maybe because every single speech code um, that has been brought before you know, courts in the Supreme Court has been struck down, do you think it's just a matter of finding an acceptable gray area? Yes, it is. And in fact, most speech codes, most issues, the important issues are never even brought up because of the dedication to the party line on the part of the intellectuals. So if somebody uh, were to put up a uh, poster in a dorm uh, saying we should defend uh, Iraq like we defended South Vietnam, uh, nobody would take it down. It wouldn't be re regarded as in violating the speech code, although it's much more egregious than any example you've given. Now, the point is that dedication to the party line is so extreme that only certain kinds of issues are never even arise. And on those issues, which are marginal ones, uh, the Supreme Court decided what it did. Uh, but it doesn't change the principle that I don't have the right to put an anti-Semitic poster in your living room, and nobody has a right to put one in the dorm where my child is. To me, I support their right to put an anti-Semitic poster in their own living room. But that's just me. You can put it in your own living room, but I don't have the right. You're evading the issue. The question is, do I have the right? And you know that I don't. Um, this, these questions come with um, respect to some time that I spent on campus, on the University of Colorado campus, speaking with students. And um, there seems to be a lot of interchangeability between the term leftist and liberal. And you see that in the journalists and some commentators, and the students especially. Can you comment on that? Do you find that that's a line of blur between leftists no, and liberals? I mean, it's part of US propaganda is to claim that centrists are leftists. That's one of the ways of eliminating critical commentary on power systems. So for example, the New York Times is described without irony as the establishment left. The Democratic Party, which is a center-right party, way to the right of the population, is regarded as left. Now those techniques have an effect. They have an effect of eliminating any authentic critique that goes, that actually takes the position of the majority of the population. Well, that becomes unspeakable because the left is already the, you know, Democratic Party and the New York Times. That's a good propaganda device. So liberal leftist lines are blurred as far as this it's not blurred. blurred. I mean, like most terms of political discourse, uh, you know, they they are used as terms of propaganda. Open. Okay.